Welcome back, folks. It's Wednesday, June 12th, 2024. Born on this date in 1930, the late comedic actor and singer Jim Neighbors of Silicaga. In 1969, former NFL fullback and plaintiff in the high-profile concussion case, Kevin Turner of Prattville. Turner died with ALS that is believed to have been brought on by CTE. And in 1973, former NBA player Jason Caffey of Mobile. Today, a statewide award puts an exclamation point on an inspirational year for a high school baseball player. The Justice Department has taken issue with a new state law. Gambling and lottery are already back in political discussions. And we have an interview with comedian Roy Wood Jr. on his experiences working on the Road to Rickwood podcast. I'm Mike Morgan, and we're down in Alabama. Yancey Young was playing with a travel baseball team last summer when he started having back pain. He had been to see a couple of doctors, and everybody figured it to be muscle strain. The pain didn't go away, however, and he ended up in a UAB freestanding ER in Gardendale, where they found a mass dangerously close to his heart. They immediately sent him to the hospital, did a biopsy, diagnosed him with stage 3 T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma, and started chemotherapy within two days. Now, that cancer is very treatable, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Young had 30 treatments, five hospitalizations, and four surgeries while insisting that he was going to play baseball his senior season at Summerton Christian. And he did just that, making it to every game where he wasn't in the hospital. He managed to play in 14 of the team's games and got to the plate 33 times. His inspiring effort, reports AL.com's Ben Thomas, won Young the Jimmy Smothers Courage Award, a statewide honor that was presented to him at the annual Alabama Sports Writers Association banquet this past Sunday. Now, the dramatic part of this story, at least the the on-the-field part, is that in the final game of the Class 1A state finals against Sweetwater, Young was the designated hitter and batted three for four with a walk, three RBIs, and a run scored to lead Summerton Christian to the state championship. There's something about baseball, folks. Well, the U.S. Department of Justice has taken the side of a lawsuit challenging the new Alabama law that targets ballot harvesting, reports AL.com's Mike Kaysen. Now, the law criminalizes the distribution of pre-filled absentee ballot applications or turning in an absentee ballot application for someone else, unless that person has a medical emergency. Now, the point being argued here is whether the state can restrict who voters get help from as they apply for absentee ballots. The state contends that the Voting Right Act does not prohibit the state from restricting certain parties from gathering or delivering the applications. Plaintiffs and the Justice Department, on the other hand, argue that the Voting Rights Act already restricts employers and labor unions from helping with the applications and that states cannot restrict anyone beyond that. Well, folks, we just can't wait until the next legislative session to pass along news about an effort to put gambling in a lottery on the ballot. Now, you know the rule here, never bet on these things, but David Bronner, the CEO of the Retirement Systems of Alabama, told reporters after a quarterly meeting that he wants Governor Kay Ivey to call a special session to try to get something done that hasn't gotten done in 24 years, reports AL.com. So Mike Kaysen. Now, many Alabama lawmakers just put a whole year's work into trying to get a lottery-slash-gambling bill passed, only to see it fall one vote short in the Alabama Senate. The reason Bonner said he would like to see a special session is that he believes a combination of recent tax cuts and leaner times ahead will eventually leave the state badly needing funds. Quote, that train is coming down the track, he said. In Italy, they're calling recent New Hope High School grad Hayden Hill the Miracle Boy. That's according to Lindsey Sanderson, who's organized a GoFundMe page for Hill. Hill survived a 60-foot fall off a cliff in Rome during a class trip. 
and now he needs a medical flight to return to the U.S., and folks, that's expensive. He suffered a dislocated hip and femur and ankle injuries. 77% of Alabama third graders were reading on grade level this spring, reports AL.com's Trisha Powell Crane. However, state and local officials, as well as media, including AL.com, have previously interpreted or reported the data to mean that 91% were reading on grade level. Now, our collective math skills notwithstanding, there has been some confusion over literacy stats as the state aims to decide which students need to be retained for reading. State education statistics show 4,800 third graders scored less than sufficient to advance to the fourth grade, and nearly 7,400 whose scores were considered sufficient but actually aren't quite on grade level. Still, the percentages show improvement over recent years. Hey, we'll be right back after this message. AL.com's Cody D. Short is going to chat with comedian Roy Wood Jr. about the road to Rickwood. Roy Wood Jr. How are you? Hello. 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 How you doing? I'm good. Good, good, good. <laughs> um, so you are the host of the Road to Rickwood podcast. And yes. the podcast tells the story of Negro Leagues in Birmingham and the history of Rickwood Field. Why did you say yes to this project? Um, because it's it, one is Birmingham too. I used to play there, so it's kind of I'm a, I got a soft spot in my heart for the baseball field. Um, but I think that it really is a beautiful story about how there was a place in the midst of all of the chaos in the South where there was at least one good thing happening. And I think when we started talking about Birmingham and the history of Alabama and the struggle and the marching. These are the type of stories that generally get overlooked. So it's an opportunity to tell a story about a different place at a different time. For sure. And we hear about a lot of the the intersection of civil rights and Brookwood Field in the first, uh, well, actually in episodes two and three the most. So um, if people have not listened to the episode, then you will definitely hear that there. Um, <laughs> so I would say that you're very passionate about baseball. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I I love the sport. I think it's a great allegory for life and about how you need the help of other people, but you have to be able to execute yourself and help yourself first if it's going to help the team. You know, baseball is a bunch of people acting alone as a group. And to me, that's exactly what a team is. It's really, in my opinion, it's exactly what life is as well. So what do you think is important for people to understand about the relationship baseball has in Birmingham? I think that the important thing about this podcast is that you all, people have to remember, football wasn't always the biggest sport in this country. It was baseball for a very long time. So much so that black people and white people who didn't want to be around each other would contently sit in the same stadium, black people at their section. And then when the Negro Leagues came, the white people sat over there because they didn't want to sit with the black people. But it was the one thing everybody agreed on was cool and dope. Like Ice Cube say, no barking from the dog, no smog. This is Rickwood. We are here to watch a beautiful game be played. And, you know, I think that while that was happening on the field, you had all types of chaos happening off the field. And so what was really dope about the podcast was that, you know, we spoke with historians, of course, and some of the architects and players for the white Barons teams. But we also spoke with former Negro leaguers who are still living and breathing today, who took the field for the Birmingham Black Barons. And, you know, the, the thing that I probably took away the most from this podcast was the degree of reverence that all of the Negro leaguers had for their time playing the game. 
I don't think there was a single person I spoke with who was angry, who was bitter, or, you know, I was too old by the time baseball integrated, so I never got a turn. And I paid, they were just proud that they got to play the game. And regardless of the mistreatment that happened between ballparks, when they were on the field, it seems that, to me that those are the memories that stuck with them the longest. And I think that's the thing that's, you know, most amazing. So to be able to have an opportunity to sit with these legends and just let them tell their story. I can't think of any other time in my life where I would get a chance to just sit with former Negro leaguers and listen to them wax poetic that like I would have done this, you know, just on the strength. Yeah. Don't, don't tell, don't tell NPR that, but I was very happy uh, to have this opportunity, you know, presented to me. Who do you think was your favorite interview? My favorite interview was former Birmingham Black Baron Al Holt. Al Holt was serious and to the point, but very, very fun. I asked him how could Major League Baseball uh, say thank you, and he rubbed his fingers together like he wanted some money. And, and sure enough, not too long after we talked to him, you know, Major League Baseball announced that every living Negro leaguer will now get a pension. You know, and it, yeah. and before it was you had to have played in the Negro leagues for four years, which is just with the way paperwork was back then, how you going to prove that for sure, for sure? You know, so to see the level of reminiscing that he had, and Al Holt is someone who saw Willie Mays when he was still a teenager playing the game of baseball when he lived out in the Birmingham suburbs out there in Fairfield. So he remembers this history. You know, we talk about the Negro Leagues and they show you the footage and it's black and white. Black and white always make you think something happened and everybody on in the in the footage is dead. A lot of them people are still alive. Absolutely. So to sit with somebody like Al Holt and hear him talk about that time and just the level of fondness and excitement the game of baseball still gives him, it was just beautiful to witness and to just be in conversation with him. For sure. Um, what's the most surprising thing you learned while working on the podcast? I'd say the most surprising thing I learned while working on Road to Rickwood was how Bull Connor became Bull Connor and the role that baseball played in, in a bad way, segregation in the state of Alabama. And Alabama being, you know, because Bull Connor, you know, gained popularity with Alabamians by essentially being a play by play baseball announcer. They had these things called baseball matinees. We go into it in episode one, where in the old days, if you wanted to hear a baseball game live, you went to a building where a dude was reading the wire report from a Western Union telegraph. So the more electric and animated somebody could read the report, it was it would be the same as a colorful play-by-play announcer today. And that's what Bull Connor was um, first in Texas and then later in Alabama. And he became so well-known for how he read the, the telegraphs at the baseball matinees that he became the voice of the community and became well-known. And he used that popularity to ride into political office. And within that office is when he started passing the laws that created all of the images that Alabama is known for today. You know, but it was also Bull kind of cheating on his wife that got the, the door, you know, opened up again for uh, baseball to be uh, integrated back in the state of Alabama. Now that I won't spoil. You got to listen to the podcast for that one. <laughs> I think you say it was spoiled. It's just bad already. Yeah. But I agree, you know, as somebody who also grew up in Birmingham, and have heard about the horror stories of Bull Connor and what he did, you know, specifically during the Children's Crusade at Kelly Ingram Park, I did not know that he was a baseball announcer at Rickwood Field until I worked on this podcast. That was very surprising yeah. for me, too. Yeah. This man was the voice of baseball. Like, as much as we know Bob Costas or Joe Buck or Al Michaels today, that was Bull Connor. So, you know, I knew who Bull Connor was, but the origins of him just being a sports guy, that was that was brand new information to me. Right. Yeah, same here. 
So in episode four, I mean, we kind of talked about some of the things that people will hear in episodes one through three. But the fourth episode, the final episode of Road to Rickwood, we talk a little bit about um, the modern day of where baseball is. And it kind of enters um, or starts at the late 70s, early 80s. And that's also when you were starting to learn about baseball itself. So what what is your personal emotions or feelings around baseball in Birmingham and even Rickwood Field? I know you talked about it a little bit before, but um, I think the people would love to know more about your experience there. I mean, you know, I played for Ramsey High School there, and I'm not going to tell some tall tales like I hit a bunch of home runs or anything. I didn't, you know. I loved baseball in spite of my inability to be dominant at it. You know, I'll just put it that way. Uh, But, you know, for people to have seen, um, to have been able to set set foot on the same field where 30% of Major League Hall of Famers have played, it's an honor. It's an honor. It also shows me that the game is the same no matter your age. And, I think that's part of what makes baseball. And I think I think that's part of what makes baseball, you know, so beautiful. I think also for me, when they renovated the stadium in the early 1990s to make it look more retro, because Hollywood came and they needed a field to shoot a bunch of old school baseball movies at, I started playing high school ball at Rickwood in 93. 92, maybe 93, and seeing the retro aspect of it, it was like, oh, wow, this sport's really been around a very long time. Like, and it really felt like you were a part of of history. You know, like Rickwood is one of the few museums that you get to play in, you know? Um, but, you know, it's, it's a special place. It still is. I'm happy that, you know, the city's getting a little bit of shine. I'm happy that the field's getting a facelift as well. Uh, in the middle of all of this. So, you know, I just think that part of it is, um, I think it's, I think in the long run, it has the potential to be a good thing for the city. I I hope that this goes well. And I hope that when Major League Baseball comes to Birmingham on June 20th and does a regular season game, I hope it goes so well that they decide to do one every year. Even though I feel like at some point they got to do one in Kansas City because Kansas City is, that's the Mecca too. Yeah. Well, you, you kind of went into one of my other questions about what do you expect will come from the event and how do you think the city will benefit? So you think you're just hoping that the game will return every year? Is there anything else? Anytime you can come to the state of Alabama and it not be about racism or something crazy, I think it's a good thing. And I think it's a start, especially if it's about trying to heal some degree of racism because they're going to honor Willie Mays at that game on the same night. So to me, if it is about a wrong attempting to be righted, that's not a word, then that to me is a net positive. Even if it doesn't touch all of the notes that we wanted to touch for me, it's one of those, Hey, I'll take it. Don't nothing else come here, you know? And if it's going to get a lot of out of town is here and seeing and experiencing the city of Birmingham, maybe you leave with a different impression of the city than what you've seen in all that black and white footage. Because if you ain't seeing Birmingham in black and white footage, you seeing us on First 48 or some stupid ass show like Bait Car. Remember Bait Car? Did you ever watch that? That's right before your time. I'm old. <laughs> you don't know about Bait Car? Where they leave a car running with the door open and wait to see who steal it, then lock them in the car and arrest them? and arrest you for car theft. Maybe I've seen it play out and just didn't know that was what it was called. <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible show, those producers. I'm sorry for <laughs> cussing. <laughs> um, so in 2019, Major League Baseball offered the city of Birmingham to build a youth foundation that would have been placed in George Ward Park. And you were an advocate for that to be brought to the city. What do you think would have been done for or let me restate that what do you think that would have done for youth baseball in the city or what do you think went wrong i don't know what went wrong what i heard went wrong was that the city told major league baseball they had the land and then some city council person was hating and 
the people in that council person's district was hating on the park being put at George Ward. So that's what I heard went wrong. And then by the time the city went back to Major League Baseball and was like, hey, thanks for the money, but we don't have the land yet. Can you give us a minute to get the hello? 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 And that was that. What it would have done for the city is given black children a place to play baseball more viably year round, especially into the summer. You know, baseball is a sport. If we're talking about the idea of increasing the number of blacks in baseball, then you have to have access to the sport and play it at a competitive level. You know, you know, I played baseball when it was in season for Little League. That's not enough. If you're going to be good at baseball nowadays, you need to be playing through the summer. Low key, you need to be playing in the fall as well. And so to do that in Birmingham right now, and you live on the West side and you don't have that type of money in your budget, you can't drive out to Shelby County every day, all summer. And you damn sure ain't going to take the bus. The max don't go past the Galleria. And it probably only go past the Galleria twice a day or something like that. So the idea of making the sport more accessible would have been a good thing because there aren't a lot of great fields in the city, especially for high schoolers, which is another issue. Even when you're playing in high school, there ain't enough fields because the ones we have are getting rained out and you got to share it with four or five other teams or the, the field don't have lights or the dirt is don't drain well. If it rained on Monday, you can't play on that field again till Thursday. And baseball sits in the middle of the rainy season in the South in Birmingham. So turf would be beneficial, but you know, it, it's a, it's a lot of different things that happen um, that have played a role in the declination of African-Americans in baseball. I won't put it all at the feet of major league baseball, but I know that definitely having a place where you can play more regularly that is accessible geographically would have been pivotal. Right. Right. What are you hoping people get from the podcast after listening to all four episodes? What are you hoping that people grasp the most? I hope that people grasp that in spite of all of the chaos that's happening around us, even if we're using present day chaos as an analogy, there are still opportunities for people to get together and see some commonality. You know, some of my favorite parts of the podcast are just talking about the time after baseball integrated and when the Barons had their first integrated team. And we, you know, we spoke with some of the white players that played with some of the black players and what that was like and how they just didn't see it as such. The thing, the, the other thing that was interesting was because when the Barons uh, came back and integrated, they were an affiliate um, at the time of the Oakland A's, I think before the White Sox. And it was a lot of white people's first time, the white players that were assigned to play minor league ball in Birmingham for a lot of them, it was their first time playing in the South. Now imagine you're white and all you know is whiteness. And then you're in a new land and you playing with integrated on an integrated team. So that was a lot for a lot of the out of towners to digest, but they were able to get through it just fine. So, you know, I think that in spite of differences, there's still opportunities to find commonality. And I think that's what, and I think that's what, you know, the spirit of Rick Woodfield represents. Well, thanks, folks, for giving us your time today. We'll be back with another state news rundown tomorrow morning. Until then, y'all come see us anytime you want to at AL.com. Mm-hmm.